Let's keep talking. It's fine. Just talk as long as you want. Um, Betsy Johnson, what's up? Lucky for you, I've got the notes. You're all good. Um, okay, let's get started though, right? Like the, all the important people are here. Kristen is here. No one else matters. They cannot, they can see themselves out the door when they leave. Um, if they show up. See this guy, whoever this is, they can just, just please can you, Black, can you close the door? Oh man, <laughs> too late. We're trying to lock you out. We're saying that if the classroom was set and you decide to come in. All right, so what we're doing today um, is part two of Aristotle. I'm wearing better, yeah. This is a famous sweater. I bought this at, at a Father Hello. I bought this at, at a, um, I bought this at an Illinois thrift shop for $2. Oh. And it says better or like belly. It, was, it says something. I got it for two bucks and it's classic. It, I always think, I think it says better, but it looks like the R is a, a dot on it. It looks like an I. So I don't know. Maybe it's Betsy. Maybe it's Betsy. <laughs> Betsy, do you want it? No. <laughs> Betsy, everything, everything has a price. Betsy, you, I don't know. Betsy, you might be like, you talk about like, you know, your family knew Bill Gates whenever. I don't know. Maybe you're like, you know, you want to give me like a million dollars of like tech stock. Then I'll give you the sweater. Yeah. I mean, like, if you make an offer for the sweater, you know. You can trade it. It was the right amount. If it's right, right, Father? I mean, like, if she wants, if she says she's going to give me a million dollars of some kind of, like, trending upwards green arrow of stock for this sweater, I think I should part with it. I'm afraid I'm a Hope Center shopper. I can put it in some book and note. How about you give me unlimited access to the Hope Center? I get, like, 20. You know what? You can donate as much money to the Hope Center as you want. Unlimited. Yeah, but what if they don't? What if they donate to me their ten best items? That's what I mean. Like I give you the sweater, and like, I think you take ten things from Hope Center. Uh, like I, they, we can make a reality out show out of it. Um, Hope floats ten items. Okay, okay. A thrift show reality. Yeah. Um, okay, guys. Today's part two of Aristotle. If anyone remembers from last class, anyone saw the last episode, or of course was here in person, we covered Aristotle to the middle point. I'm not going to rehash that. I know I don't want to cover old ground ever because you know, obviously, right? That would be a drain. If you missed any of the stuff, you can see it online. All right, let's talk about Nicomachean ethics, Aristotle's best best work on ethics, um, the science of what it means to pursue the good life. Okay, now. What let's say in a very kind of general sense, what is the ultimate point of society? Dave Schmidt, what is the point of society according to Aristotle? Progress. It's to live generously, as your shirt says. Um, what is the point of society? Anyone know what Aristotle said? Aristotle, it's kind of first point today, point number one of your keeping score. Aristotle talks about the point of the polis of the organization of many divergent interests into one, I don't want to give away the answer too much, one common interest, one common entity is what? What is it? Anyone know? What about to help each other along the way to the way of life? That's great. That's a good, that's a good, a good answer. Yeah, that's certainly part of it. But what is the aim? Remember, Aristotle and what Aquinas takes from is teleology. And um, us. Uh, Sorry? Common purpose. Yeah, exactly. And, and Aquinas says the common purpose, obviously, is the catechism said, know, love, and serve God um, in this life, be happy with him in the next. Salvation, the beatific vision. But Aristotle doesn't have all of that. He doesn't have revelation. So what would he say is the common purpose, the goal towards which we're gaining, right? What is his telos? Anyone know? We can call it completion, or was that... Plato. You're getting closer. No, you're getting closer. We're gonna break. Um, we're gonna. I thought today we have like I don't know fifty points to break apart a bunch. Absolute treasure trove slash cornucopia. That's no. It is Aristotle. But what is the ultimate goal of the political body? Oh. This community is bound together for what teleological purpose? Trish Schmidt. What is the purpose of the teleological community? And the club is popping. There's like fifty nine people here. This is awesome. All of you are so intelligent. You count for multiples. Um. Guys, guys, uh, Pope Francis just joined the stream. Um, <laughs> hey, hey, uh, Pope Frank, yeah. He's, he's come before, he's come before the fact. Um, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm gonna send out, hey, I'm sending out, I'm sending out a, a, a thing for my next hippo lecture. I'm sending out a promo poster. Pope Francis endorsed my next hippo lecture. 
You'll see that on the thing when you get it later. There's a quote from him about why you should attend. As you guys continue to get the chairs ready, you're actually doing this right now, okay? This is live action. What is the point of the community, Aristotle says? The common woman. The common good. The common good. Look at Sam Tresland and Clay Zimmerman common gooding this space, making sure everyone's comfortable, making sure that there's, there's you know, enough room, all that kind of stuff. Yes. Oh, man. Please note that first thing, okay? Oh. Aristotle says the common purpose of life, that which towards which we're gaining, and the only reason why we're why we get into political body is for the common good, for common flourishing. Yeah. Who wants to comment on Dave, your father or Wayne? You're, you're like Dave, you're like in the you're like in the wings. Come, you just cut across the front. <laughs> like he's coming across the front. So everyone, are all 59 people settled? Everyone ready? Well, I'm just, I'm actually done. I'm done. I'm out of here. Paper split. Aristotle says the purpose of the polis, of the community, is the common good, is the common flourishing. Now, what are the three transcendentals, my friends? Anyone know? Again, I'm, I'm going to stop numbering now. This will be number point number two for today's notes. Four, two, three, and four, because they're going to be one, two, three, right? What are the three transcendentals? These are three things to which you know you're an atheist, you're a Buddhist, you're a devout Catholic, you're a Christian, you're Jewish. Like whatever tradition you come from, just being a person, these transcend, transcend whatever quote unquote tribal divisions we may have, and they all speak about God and His immutable qualities and draw us towards elucidating what the common good is and might be. What are the three transcendentals? The blank, the blank, and the blank. What are they? Good, true, beautiful. Exactly. The good, the true, and the beautiful. Don't get me off on a tangent on art, but please understand with art, a question often is, I love postmodern art, actually. I really do. If a guy's like, that's a toilet on the wall that symbolizes we're all in the toilet now, our society. It's like, that's, that's genius. I like that while also liking classical art. Classical art, classical art, Greek sculpture, Renaissance stuff, was and is mimetic. What is mimesis? And we know what mimesis means. What is mimesis? Mimicking nature. Yeah, yeah exactly. So the classic standard for art before the postmodern era, before why is there a toilet on the wall? I don't know if anyone saw recently, uh, some gentleman, two examples. One guy typed a banana to the wall taped a banana to the wall and a guy paid $250,000 for it. And then he ate it. <laughs> I'm dead serious. And an Italian sold for the worst thing of all time, the most disgusting, embarrassing, this is, this is going too far. He sold an imaginary sculpture for $18,000, including with um, installation requirements. Like it must be in a five by five space. Well, <laughs> like you gotta say the barb, you know what? You can't steal an imaginary sculpture. So he's like, take that art piece. You guys wanna pilfer this bad boy? I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> I stole it. No, you didn't. Well, that's your opinion. I say it's still here. Old guys, old art, the old rules of art was my mimesis. Something is as beautiful as it mimics art, as it mimics nature. So, like uh, if you if you like the David, my plan was David, it's very mimetic. It looks like a man or the Mona Lisa, Da Vinci's Mona Lisa, and her, you know, impossible to capture like 50 expressions in the way she's smiling. That's mimetic. It, it almost goes beyond like the, the human, right? It's so human, it goes almost beyond its art. Okay. Towards Plato's forms. Or Plato's forms. Okay, exactly. Towards Plato's forms, towards this abstract realm, which Sam Kresslin, despite being mm -hmm. Aristotle, a very dirt under finger fingernail scientist, we're still going to be very much in the abstract as well. Where am I going with all of this? Because this is all like minus, like subterranean to the first point I made that Aristotle says the whole point of the polis is the common good, is common flourishing, is goal, which Aquinas extrapolates out and really builds upon the polis. Salvation is Christ, is, is the beatific vision. What will you have, Thomas? You've written well with me. Christ says, nothing but you, Lord, right? He builds on that. Aristotle says the goal is this common flourishing. To get to the common flourishing, we need the good, the true, and the beautiful. And the good, the true, and the beautiful are often mimesis, are mimetic. Something is good if it mimics the goodness that is God. God doesn't have good as a characteristic. He is the good, right? God isn't 
oh, he's beautiful. He is beauty and he is truth. Christ himself says in the 14th chapter of St. John's Gospel, I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? Father Crappy, one of my favorite preachers, is fond of saying about Christ, truth is not something, it's someone. Person, right? All, all truth is in Christ, in the God-man. So Aristotle is getting at this kind of idea of the good, the true, and the beautiful, and that a society, please note this, please do not overlook this. Society has to be divided into roles. We're doing that here. Father, you are a priest. Sincerely, thank you for your service. Thank you for your vocation. Uh, people are bakers. I'm a professor. People are, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. People do stuff. We have this in Moscow, which is our small polis. We're all pursuing, let's say, the common good in that way by being different things. People downstairs, division of labor, make very good coffee at Monica's Coffee Shop. Total shout out. Very good. Do they pay me to say this? Yeah. So what? That's part of my contract. I have to plug Monica's five times. I get $10,000 for doing this. So wouldn't you do it if you were me? I would. Um, we divide our labor up to pursue the common good. Of the three transcendentals, the good and the true, what is Aristotle actually most about? Anyone know? It's kind of, it might be interesting. You might, might be kind of a trick question. Aristotle likes what above all? What, what? Of the three trans, so, so, so and, and we know we, we we really no that that's, that's actually that's hilarious that's so that's so true. There's a lot of head spinning stuff. We've like drop like really ten and like you know things in like a whirlpool right now, right? It's like well, let's break it apart. What I'm asking is we've established what my thesis is. We've established the good, the true, and the beautiful. And then Aristotle mm -hmm. says that polis politics are good because people come together to pursue the common good. He does not have the American every politician's a crook attitude. Politics is good. The political body writ large, not just political science, but the community is good. For him, the telos is this, like you said, this, this flourishing, all of us getting together. But what is he most interested in? You flourish by doing what? We have a, a community because of this. All of us do different things because of this one singular thing. What is it? I think it's good, but it could be true. It's neither of them. It's beauty. Really? That's why I said it's a trick question. Exactly. The city, but that, that, that was a perfect answer because it's exactly, I would assume, well, it's got to be good. Good is most important. Do you want a society to be good, true, or beautiful? I mean, like good or true. I want it to be, and, but here's the hilarious thing. M much smarter scholars than I am have seen a Trinitarian thing in the transcendentals. The good is the true and the beautiful. And the beautiful is the good and the true. You can't separate them, mm -hmm. right? It's amazing. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the, the perfect unity. That's pretty cool, right? Like, let's end the class right there. It's not even, that's not, we're not going to talk that. In the good, the true, and the beautiful, you have this Trinitarian logos, right? So it's like, oh, beautiful. That sounds superfluous. What, just a bunch of models walking around on a runway? You know, just like, oh, beautiful song? Who cares? Let's, let's do, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a blue collar. I'm, a, I'm like Merle Haggard and working man blues. And I'm about practical stuff, you know? I'm about, you know, punching that clock. Great. Well, punching the clock, if that's true, because it helps society, it's also a beautiful act. Like they're, they're, But he says, we divide labor up to pursue beautiful acts. We divide labor up so all of us don't have to go hunt the woolly mammoth together. The father can pursue his vocation. Thank God, go to mass and receive the Eucharist because of him. And I can be a professor and we can have these classes, um, which some of you are like, I wish we didn't. Um, <laughs> that was, I torture you with these classes. <laughs> We have a new guest today, Kristen, who's our, I'm already a huge fan. She's awesome. And she's like, I saw some of the, she's we had this really nice talk for class. And she's like, um, and I saw some of the videos beforehand on YouTube. I was like, that was good. And I sent them to her. But what you said, I'm like, ooh, I wonder what you think. Are you, obviously she's not, she's here. So but I was like, well, we do a lot of nonsense stuff. There's a lot of joking and singing. And she said she likes it. So I believe her. Anyways, right. He says that we divide, we divide the labor up so we can pursue beautiful acts we can pursue beautiful things good things now you ready for a lot of like real wow like a lot of stuff here ready again the whole class is going to be this sorry it's aristotle right it's like aristotle dense is like can we have mozart not make a beautiful composition He's mozart the aristotle is philosophically dense sorry so aristotle says ready let's go by order the highest good for humans the highest aim of all human practical thinking psychological well-being remember suke psycho just means the soul Right, psychology is the science of the soul, right? A psychologist is a soul doctor. So the highest psychological well-being, highest aim for all humans, exactly, Pat, thank you, this flourishing that you used, is called eudaimonia. Ready? E-U-D-A-I-M-O-N-I-A. -I -I eudaimonia. 
is properly understood as ongoing, stable, dynamic well-being. If you are in a state of flourishing, I love being a stay-at-home mom. I feel like, you know, I do this great curriculum for my kids and I, I teach them at home as well. And I'm a really great baker and blah, blah, blah. I love being this high level businessman, New York, whatever you're, whatever it may be, it can be as diverse as anything. If you feel like, you know, I'm really flourishing. The Japanese, I mentioned before, have the saying of like the perfect work day is not working yourself to death. It's also not being lazy. It's just doing enough and taking an awesome bubble bath. That's like eudaimonia, perfect balance. Eudaimonia, please note, relates perfectly to Aristotle's golden mean. Right? You might reach eudaimonia, flourishing, ongoing psychological well-being by being a balanced person. And it's stability, right? It's stability. Um, Christ famously says in Matthew 16, 6, beware the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Beware the right and the left. Beware extremes. Right? This is a religious and practical reason type thing. Often, the truth is not found in psycho extreme. Well, I'm just so super alt right. That's correct. I'm so alt left. Like no, right? It's all, like Christian truth, practical truth, eudaimonia, flourishing, golden. That's found in balance. It's found in balance, right? Talked about parent about parenthood last class. We said a good father and mother discipline their kids when they need to, but because uh, because obviously the other side is bad. Like like I'm going to smoke marijuana in the base with my kids, and they can do whatever they want. Like that's obviously bad. Being permissive. But if you're yelling at your kids 24, that's also that. Like, it, it's, there's a balance. I'm going to teach my kids the right moral virtues and values, but also always letting them know that I'm, I'm on their side. I love them, right? So much of that golden mean balance is tied in with eudaimonia. Okay. If you want to reach eudaimonia, which is the ultimate goal, you should practice arete, A-R-E-T-E. I don't know what accent I'm trying to say that with. I can't speak Greek. Is that like a Spanish accent? Kristen, we speak Spanish in five times. We really do. It's just absolutely conquistador level Castilian Spanish, the highest quality Spanish. Um, I don't know if this is if this is you know what accent, but I think arete. I don't want to say arete. I don't know. I don't want to sound like a total gringo. But a r e t e, arete means kind of virtue in action, in excellence. Remember, eudaimonia. Point number one is the goal. Psychological stable well being, arete is excellent virtues. Basically, just living your life like Dave Schmidt. Just imitate everything he does. It's also an English word, the same spelling for uh, a mountain ridge. Is it really? Wow. I, I, I'm not even, I'm not even getting, I have no idea. Do you know, is there any connection with that? Like, is there any? Yeah, I can't. You can't tell me what it is, guy. <laughs> if I told you, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> You'd have to write it down first. Mm -hmm. Got it. Carl, can you know that? Uh, that piece of graffiti that's near your house that says be a mobile. Be a mobile, yeah. I can't say it. It's disgusting. It's so, annoying. it's so annoying, so cringe. Yeah, it's like um it's it's like Spanglish is the word. Speak Spanish or English. Don't do it. Be a mob. And the B is like where it's like blocked into the side where you can't even read it. It's just like a mobile. It's like a mobile. Sweet, you know, cool, dude. Okay. Like, we also have a word in English, be amiable. It's I like, get, that's exactly that's a phrase. I don't I know if it's worth painting on the um, it's not worth it's not worth it. yeah i think i think in spanish what being mean is antipatico right so it's like oh i was gonna be antipatico today but be a mom like okay <laughs> i guess i was considering being i was considering, you know, I, was, I, was, I was considering like i was considering like punching cats and then i saw be a mom and then, then i saw this seductively yeah like yeah. Eight yeah. Eight yeah. Eight yeah. Eight yeah. Eight yeah. exactly i should be more are, are cats better or dogs? What's better, dogs, right? Obviously, <laughs> anyone know? Okay, okay. <laughs> like, I love like. Never mind. Never mind. Let's get back on topic. Let's get back. You know, Kristen is here, and I want to make a good person try to convert. But I want her to be like that. Class was tight and it's professional. None of this nonsense. Okay. So eudaimonia. Eudaimonia is. Now remember the goal. Flourishing. Psychological. Like, you're like, wait a second, you keep repeating this over again. I know. Repetition is the mother of all learning. If it's the first time you've heard these terms, it's good to repeat them. Eudaimonia is that flourishing, stable, psychological, ultimate goal, that telos. So let's connect it back further. Aristotle would say the point of politics, the community, is the beautiful acts, good, the true, and the beautiful, and then the same. And beautiful acts lead to eudaimonia. 
a father's beautiful act is being a priest. Thank God again for, for vocation. So he will reach the state of, of happiness having answered that vocational call. I've talked to many priests who said like, God bothered them with that vocational call. God wouldn't give them peace. They answered this call. He's calling them to be a priest, right? So like, and so you can say, if you want to be super like new age um, self-help book, eudaimonia is like being the best version of yourself. Like it's, it's what you're meant to be, right? Arete is virtue in action, is being what you're supposed to be, right? I see you guys are smiling over here, whatever. I see you guys are talking about stuff. I'm not going to ask what it is. You, you honestly can keep it to yourself. I bet, I bet it's funny. I bet it's funny. And please continue on. I just want to say that I've noticed you guys. Um, <laughs> they're just screwing around. They're just screwing around. Yeah. They would know, but it, it would know. Okay, so so eudaimonia, ultimate psychological thing, arete, excellence and virtue. Anyone know what is the driving agent of all this though? You imply this, you attach your soul to blank, and that leads to being very arete like, and that leads you to eudaimonia. Everyone's flourishing, and like if that's all we learn in the class today, that is like sick. That is a lot of info. But what is that ultimate thing? And the Greeks love this. Anyone knows what that is? Logos, logos, and hence we come all the way back to our class. This class is logic. Logic comes from the word logos. In the Greek New Testament, St. John's Gospel, we have right in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. In RK, uh, something, I mean, I don't speak Greek, logos. The word is logos. Christ is the logos of God. And John writes that to show the Greeks, like, hey, this, this term, logos is the most important term in Greek philosophy. Just know that, please. Well, God says it means like logic, reason, rationality, God, divine wisdom, all that stuff. So again, let's go, let's build it up and let's move on. If you tap into divine logos, this is why Aristotle is a proto-Christian. He doesn't understand that logos is a person, it's Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. But he's just like, if you tap in this ultimate wisdom, you will practice arete, you will reach eudaimonia, the whole community will be happy. And it goes into interview. Isn't that sick? That is so cool. That is sick with two Cs, S-I-C-C. Um, that is dirty and filthy in a positive way. Like that was filthy philosophy. Like I enjoyed that. That was really great. You know, like kind of thing. This is why I love postmodernism. I do. I guess I love postmodern terms. Sorry, anyone doesn't like them. You know, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to tell you. Um, live a little, I'd say. Um, be a great soul. Be a great soul is the highest praise that you can receive, according to Aristotle. Being magnanimous, magnanimous, as he would say. So again, all this is going to be connected to the obvious, but all these, if, you, if, you're, if you're living with Logos, Arete, reaching eudaimonia, the greatest thing I can say about you, Barb, is you are a magnanimous person. You are a large soul. You have enlarged your soul. We as Christians say, by the grace of God, Aristotle's by practicing Arete style virtues in excellence. The ruler in the community, the philosopher king, these guys are not Democrats. So what I mean by that is like we're all Democrats. So all of us who are the most conservative, most liberal, as being Americans, we believe in democracy, right? I bet President Biden in the state of union tomorrow is going to say, I'm going to like bet on it, but he's like over under, you know, like 100 bucks. If he says it more than these times, I get the money, we'll lose like 68 times. Probably say democracy. We're defending democracy, right? Ukraine, democracy, democracy. How, how is that good or bad? I have no comment on President Biden. Like I said, I don't get involved. Barb, you know that. Mm -hmm. And Barb and I, just the fact that we, you know, go down to our, you know, I love Joe meetings, and, you know, <laughs> that's outside of the class, you know. <laughs> just because Barb and I, like, you know, because we're super, like, crazy leftist actors, doesn't mean we bring that in the class. Seriously, though, like, we, we as Americans, we as Americans, we as Americans, right, whether we, you know, are to the left, to the right, neutral, we all claim at least like democracy. I, I like voting. I think everyone else like to vote. Aristotle imagines the community being run by a philosopher king. The ideal would be someone like Pericles, who is you know, before his, his time, this golden age of Athens, mid fifth century BC. And Aristotle says the, one of the greatest kind of qualities of a, a philosopher king is fairness in, in ruling, temperance, when, once more golden mean, and kind of the true friend is the ultimate measure. This sounds a lot like what? Someone hit me with this. This sounds a lot like what? What Christian virtue? Anyone know? The Christian virtue of love your neighbors yourself. It's just kind of that thing. The good, the good ruler, the being mm -hmm. a good friend means like ultimate um filial, like philo, brotherly love, empathy. Like Barb, I can rule you, you know, you, you're my subject, you guys are my subjects. If I can literally step in your shoes, like how would I like it if I if that they did it to me? Okay, so I will like lower the taxes or gas prices or whatever example is you want. 
Aristotle says that um, it, to achieve all these highest goods, ultimate eudaimonia, you need both blank and blank, practical and what, what sides. The practical and the theoretical. You need the abstract and the concrete. And G.K. Chesterton, a gentleman who we will cover in this class later on to my great chagrin. I'm just kidding. I love Chesterton. You're like, great chagrin. Why did you put him in the syllabus? Exactly, right? That would be illogical. I love Chesterton. Chesterton said, in order to get anything in the, in the uh, concrete, you must ask in the abstract. Uh, and everyone knows, right? All good things that happen in earth and bad things too begin in the, in the mind. They're an idea first. I had an idea to go punch that cat. And then that was a theoretical thing. And then I acted it out as bad. I had an idea to solve, you know, the energy crisis, right? I sat down at the table and thought about fracking and fossil fuel. And then, and then we did something, electric vehicles, whatever you want to, you know, examples are, are, are myriad and kind of endless. Please note this. In doing so, Aristotle, for maybe one of the first times, reconciles these two things. Often in the pre-Socratic, pre-Aristotelian, Plato and Socrates time, like Betsy said, if you're Platonic thought, you're often very much head in the clouds. You're very much on the theoretical side. And maybe you have people who go too far to the practical application. Aristotle is about the theoretical and the practical, but he says, ultimately, what is the, the calling card of virtue and ethics? Anyone know? This is very, very Christian. This is very grandma kind of cliche. Blank, not blank. Hey, Dave, don't blank, blank. If, if I give you one word, I'm going to give it away. I know I'm being so coy and it's not making sense even, but it's, it's all or nothing. Hey, don't, uh, don't tell me. Show me. So Aristotle is about the practical, the theoretical, and we need both. And you got to sit around and think. And that's what we're doing this class. This class is philosophia, where we're love of wisdom. But it doesn't matter if you don't put it into action ultimately. You know, God so loved the world, he sent his only son, whoever believes in him might not perish, but have eternal life. The famous John 3.16. God could have just in his mind done that, snapped his fingers, but he showed us, right? Christ actually actually died on the cross for us. Action, ultimate action. He didn't just talk about it. Right? Christ in his teachings, why? Duh, right? Christ is the son of God. He's the only bridge, true God, true man. He's incomparable to any philosophers because he's divine and no one else is. So it's, it's not a fair comparison. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying the reason Christian philosophy is so superior to you is like, there's a lot of guys who are like wise guys. And I don't mean that as you know the, the mafiosa term. Like wise men, sages. Oh, yeah, I just have deep wisdom. Come to my cave in the mountains and I'll spew stuff to you, right? Like Oracle Delphi stuff. Whatever, dude. Great. You know, I went to ask Kristen for advice and she gave me a bunch of like, you know, clouded terms and stuff and seek deep inside the inner light. It's like, awesome. You sound super smart. No idea what that means. I left kind of just whatever. I don't know. I guess I'm on my own. If your theoretical is fine, you have to have a practical application. And Christianity is all about that. And of course, um, this is why Aristotle is such a boss and why Christians like him so much. He's about that in the, in the polis, in the state, in your personal life. Don't just talk about it. Apply that which you've learned. So Aristotle says that whereas virtue of thinking means teaching experience and time, virtue of character comes about as a consequence of the right habits. Does that make sense? Virtue of thinking, when you get into this kind of philosophical stuff, this theoretical side, you, are, you need good teachers, you need experience, and you need time. You got to grind a very famous Roman guy who's obviously not famous enough for me to remember his name. I think it was Livy, the historian. But he said, um, you know, something like, uh, study as if you will live forever. Like, don't rush it. And all of us have probably come up to this conundrum, right? I want to learn Spanish, but I only have limited time. So I'm going to ever try to do like five hours a day and I go nuts and then burn out and don't do it for a year, right? And fail. How about learn Spanish if you have an attorney to learn it? Learn like just like three phrases a day so you can actually build a proper thing. Like it takes time to learn stuff. It takes time to become a good carpenter in the, in the apprenticeship, whatever it is, right? So virtue of thinking needs teaching experience and time. But virtue of character, once you've acquired that, it's about the right habits. Who has heard it takes 30 days to develop a habit? Anyone heard that? 30 days. 30 days to develop a habit. Like if you want to, Dave, if you want it every day for six weeks, then, then that's longer. Yeah. I've heard 61 years. <laughs> a uh, from Ecclesiastes, a whole a, a one fly spare spoils a whole barrel of ointment. That's exactly yeah. I mean, like I, I, I can tell you about some of my habits. I don't want to make you feel bad. You'd be like, dang, it's good habits. I don't have this. I'm not going to talk about. <laughs> but I'm, I'm serious. All of us have habits we like and don't like. 
right? I don't like the habit that I, you know, smoke 90 cigarettes a day, let's say, right? But I do like the habit that I swim in the pool, whatever, right? Everyone has good and bad habits, but they're both a habit. If you're like, oh, I, I need to get on that nicotine patch. Well, what is the, <laughs> these, these commercials for, for quitting smoking? I forget what it's called, Nicoderm or something. I forget, but it's kind of nicotine. Patch. But uh, that is a habit. Someone's trying to break the habitual, you know, uh, inclination to smoke cigarettes. But if someone every day has gotten in the habit of every day I get up and I do, you know, 30 push ups and 30 sit ups and do a plank and go for a brisk walk, it's a good habit. I mean, like, it, he says that that is the practical side, that is the virtue ethic side. It's always the action side. Okay. Surprise, surprise, guys. People will reach arete excellence if they their good habits outweigh the bad habits. Is that shocking? I don't think anyone's shocked by that, right? And in fact, he says, talking about virtue and vice, here's a word for you, kalos or kalos. I have no clue how to pronounce this. You pronounce what you want. K-A-L-O-S. I always think kalos always sounds too enthusiastic. I like the more subdued, the lower octave kalos. Sounds more uh, dignified. I don't know. But K-A-L-O-S. A virtuous person feels pleasure when they perform the most beautiful or noble acts. Okay, kalos. So the callous is the pleasure that's derived from doing a virtuous act? Callous is the noble. Uh, yeah, excuse me. Yes, yeah, so let, let me, that's a great question, right? Is callous the act itself or the, the or feeling? The right. Um, the callous is, is the noble act. And then the, the, the callous is the performance of the noble act. Is the noble act in action. Mm -hmm. A person feels a virtuous person, a, an arete person, a eudaimonia person, feels pleasure when they perform the most beautiful and noble actions. But a non-virtuous person will always feel misled in what they identify as noble. Oh man, I mean that is so. Yeah, we can. There's so many times you can just end the class. That's a great statement, right? We we know from Socrates, who taught Plato, Plato being Aristotle's teacher, no man willingly chooses the evil. Every person thinks they're doing is good. If a person has logos, the operating system, right reason attuned to arete, excellence and virtue towards eudaimonia. They will have a right understanding of what is noble. I like to help the old ladies across the street because I am perfectly lo logical. I'm a tune. That's a good action. I have these, these wonderful, you know, old women who live next to me every day. I help them to the bus stop. Even that stupid, silly example, that would be callous. Like, I should feel good about that. These women uh, you know, maybe need the help of a crossing guard. And it's a busy street where people are not callous. They don't, they drive like maniacs and it's dangerous. So me, that's the right thing. But a person stuck in an addiction, right? Maybe like, yeah, I'm doing this drug because it's good. Like, this is what life's about. Life's about this drug. Or, you know, we see the horrible, like, the sad thing. God bless these people. People like, you know, I'm addicted to pornography. Or, you know, I'm addicted to um, uh, drinking, a classic one, smoke, whatever it is. Those people, Aristotle would say, are not virtual. We as Christians say that there are, are hurt brothers and sisters. They need healing. God bless these people. We're all sinners. We're all broken in some way, Right. But you'd say, yeah, they're, they're, they're broken in a way they don't possess the proper virtue. They're not choosing like to smoke all day long because they think it's bad. They think that's good. They're disordered. Their, their soul is disordered. A disordered soul will lead to what Plato said, a disordered society, right? Remember, the guardians, the will, the appetite. If your appetites are disordered, you don't have this chaos properly attuned. It will lead to lots of disorder. Great question. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Well, you're talking, something comes to mind that we've probably all heard, and that's within our faith, um, the idea that if, I, if I, I'm helping a little lady across the street, to use your example, so I'm doing good, but only because I know it may give me a hand. But yeah. you're doing good, it's good for you. Well, the best I'm getting at is, um, yeah. is would we pursue our faith if we found out, you know, uh, that's kind of not too much, but I still don't know. So I think, yes. So I think the motive doesn't matter so much, or you should aim for a pure motive that is both disinterested, but, but, but they're bound up because it's like, look at the best example of this is look at the difference between perfect and imperfect contrition. I don't have to explain this to Catholics, but maybe some people are like, wait, explain it to me, but I don't want to raise my hand. I don't know. So if you don't admit you don't know, I'll just tell you right now. Both are sufficient to receive absolution confession. Imperfect contrition means, you know, I just don't want to go to hell. I don't know if I'm like that sorry. I just this is I know this is bad. And I, I just I'm scared of God's punishment. I don't want to go to hell. 
That's good, but we should aim for perfect attrition means. I'm just sad that I offended God, my daddy, who I love. Imagine like your, your, your child. Imperfect attrition is, I didn't grab the cookie because I don't want mom and dad to be mad at me. I want to grab the cookie and I don't respect why they say that. It's stupid, actually. I want the cookie, but I just want to get in trouble. Well, that's still good they didn't take the cookie, but the better is I love mom and dad. If they told me I take the cookie, that's good enough for me. A perfect love, perfect attrition. Same thing here. You should be doing it ultimately in disinterest, not just what I can get out of it, but what you get out of it is it's connected to it. It can't be separated from it. So it's like, I would love to have a society of terrible people who only do things out of imperfect contrition, who only give to the poor because they don't want to go to hell. That'd be great. And I would be like, well, how dare you? You like love the poor. That's the goal. But it's like, you're still helping the poor. St. James, this is the optimism in his second, in his chapter two, right? He's like, you can't, don't tell a guy, oh, keep warm, brother. Don't give him the means of life. Well, same thing. You can give the guy the means of life, even if you're like, hey, F you, by the way, you know, you're a bomb, whatever. Well, he's still like, he, he gave him the means of life. That's still good. You shouldn't have the attitude. You should be nice too. But it's like, what matters is the action, the practical thing, the theoretical, right? Well, that's what society does in the sense of, I shouldn't do that because I might go to jail. And that's fine. That, that, that's a good and perfect contrition. You're right. Our laws are imperfect contrition. Your attitude towards the law should be, I don't want to commit crimes because I love my society. I love my fellow men. But if some people are like, I'm not going to commit crimes because I just don't want to get punished, that's great. Don't commit the crime. I want no crime in society. If that's what it takes, I don't care, dude. If you're like, well, I'd love to actually be living in a zombie apocalypse. I can do what I want. I, as long as you're just not doing bad things, that's fine with me. You know, like, but we're aiming for something better, right? Aristotle says, uh, in terms of what is best, um, we aim once more for the golden mead. So being proficient in art, for example, he says, we're talking a lot about we're talking more about politics. Sorry, if you're like, I don't like politics, talking more about politics. Being skilled in art can be discreet, described as a mean between excess and efficiency. When things are well done, we say that we don't want to add or take away. That's very cool. Imagine I write you a story. I mean, I do, right? These hippo lectures I talk about, I present fiction, right? I'm sure I have a lot of that on both ends. I'm sure people listen to my stories, even if they enjoy them and say, I, I would add some stuff. Right, so so there's deficiency. I would, I would, he should talk about this in the story, and there's def, and there's excess. That was way too much. He, you know, like he's he's done that too much. If I wrote a perfect story, someone would say I can't add anything because I can talk about everything, but I can't take any away. That's perfection. Is that cool? So 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 it's not it's not mediocrity. It's not like he gave an okay story. So that's the best story. Like Dostoevsky is the best writer, and this guy's the worst. I like him because he's the most medium. That's not golden mean. Golden mean is it's so perfect. I can't add a note or take a note away. Sick. Barb, I can tell you're like, that's the work I do in my life. She has this perfect confidence expression. Like that's me every day crushing in that way. And we're, congratulations. I wish you luck in keeping that up. All right. Let's talk more about politics, guys. Oh, man. Let's talk about Biden and Trump and Obama because actually Aristotle traveled in time and he had a lot of nice things to say about Trump. So are you ready? Aristotle believed in the organic whole of the political system. He was aware. And we already talked about what we talked about with Paul. We, we already talked about what he said about the, the political system. It's a good, the good, the true, beautiful, beautiful is most important. All of us don't have to hunt the woolly mammoth. We're all about the good, eudaimonia. We talked about that. What about the kind of nuts and bolts of it? He's aware of the existence of potential of larger empires. Yeah. Like who, dot, dot, dot. Who's Aristotle's dot, dot, dot? Aristotle knows of these guys. Who are these guys? Remember, who knows Greek history a little bit this time? Fifth century BC, who's the great empire this time? It's not the Greeks. Who is Persians. it? The Persians. The per Aristotle would have heard the stories of Thermopylae, you know, 80 years ago mm -hmm. for him, right? Yeah. He's aware of these Persian empire type sprawling systems. The Persians are the first United you know, States of America. This huge, tolerant, believe what you want, just pay tax to the emperor, and very kind of like economic oriented. Anyways, he's aware of that. But he says, the city is the ultimate thing. So I think Aristotle loved the Athenian city-state. Guys, according to Aristotle, all of us should identify as what? Not um, Idahoans. That's the largest. Muscovites. Muscovites, exactly. It's not enough to say, um, that is a great form. Whose form is that? Mm -hmm. you. What if, it's, what if it was? I, I, I'm going to be awesome. If it was my phone. That'd be awesome. That'd be. I got me. I, I'm, I'm dead serious. That is a cool ringtone. Well done. That's an awesome ringtone. Um, I was thinking like I want. I, I want to. I want to steal that ringtone now. That is a very cool ringtone. I was hoping that was my phone. It's not, unfortunately. Um, he would say, I, like I don't. United States is too big, right? He would say it's a huge empire like the Persians. Idaho's a state. It's also like very large. 
And, um, but as Betsy said correctly, yeah, like we should identify as Muscovites. The city the, the, is the ultimate thing. Because here's another Greek term. If you're not annoyed yet, maybe you will be now. Oinonia, K-O-I-N-O-N-I-A. It's community partnership, political partner. Koinonia is the ultimate thing. The aim of the city is not just to avoid injustice, Dave Schmidt, right? It's kind of, you know, imperfect contrition towards crime or economic stability, but rather to allow some of the citizens the possibility of the good life to perform beautiful acts. Everyone got that? We want to be Muscovites, the Koinonia, a local community, not too large an empire, for the purpose of pursuing this eudaimonia, these beautiful acts, arete on the eudaimonia, by way of what? Arete on the eudaimonia, by what engine? What's the engine? By Logos, right? Thomas the Tank Engine style. Anyone like Thomas Tank? Amazing show. So good. So good. The man, what's what's the name? I've heard him called the, the conductor. Like he's, they call him, some call him like the fat conductor at one point. All the original stories. Why is that relevant to this class? Why would you? <laughs> I've all oh, your right. Right. I know. Good for you. I mean, like again, I, I've never heard anything about you that's negative. Like your your stock in my mind is like this. That's more. Like that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Thomas Tank is right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's awesome. You see an Anglican dude? You know, probably right. I assume so. I can't remember now. Reverend Audrey sounds like some Anglican vicar in Oxfordshire <laughs> who had too much time on his hands. So like, I'm going to write a story about a anthropomorphic train. Well, um, the whole, I think the whole philosophy, if you will, behind it is be useful. Dave, I don't care. Whatever. <laughs> it is exactly. I'm a very, I'm a very useful <laughs> agent. Exactly. That's so British wasp. Make yourself useful. Change society. Make yourself useful by going down. Stop sucking up. Stop it. Thomas is kind of a rebel, though. Like he steals his dad's larger train. Joy Joy rides it. He's always down at the bar. They're like kind of ID him, and he's like, "I'm a train. I don't have an ID." You know, he's like, "I don't have ID. I'm a train." So they pour that liquor in his. In his Give me a drink. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> Give me a picture. Guess what? Train. Guess you know how much train? Hey, we go down. We go down to the pub, right? We need to get a pint. You know what, Thomas? He's gallons. Yeah. He needs gallons poured into his thing. I got can party. All right. So, quote, the political partnership must be regarded, therefore, as being for the sake of noble actions, not for the sake of living together. End quote. Listen, one more time. And actually, before I quote this, everything once more. We're aiming towards eudaimonia, ultimate happiness, arete by way of logos, beautiful act, the good, the true, and the beautiful. And we can't do that if we're like United States of America, too large, Idaho, too large. You know, Idaho too large. <laughs> Insert Idaho joke. I want to stay focused. Idaho too large. Muscovite, Moscow. That's enough of a koinonia, political partnership. But we're not living together simply for the purpose of economic prosperity or laws. We're not to avoid like wars. No, quote, the political partnership must be regarded, therefore, as being for the sake of noble actions, not for the sake of living together. Everyone got that? Very good. Okay. Plato and Aristotle, both skeptical of democracy, despite the fact that Aristotle departs from his master, Aristotle, dirt under the nails, more practical. He's theoretical and practical. Aristotle is very much the scientist guy. Plato's more abstract forms. They're both critical of democracy. They're both like, no. Plato may, believes democracy is untenable and most endangered by what? And Aristotle agrees. The Aristotle, well, I mean, if he was... <laughs> Not communism. I couldn't think of a joke fast enough, Sam. Um, not by the self by the selfishness of the citizens. Democracy is untenable, they say, because citizens are selfish in the competing interests. I always just want my Bud Light and you know my fishing hole. Actually, I want everyone to be super woke, super. I mean, there's too many competing interests, and so it's unstable, he says. So they believe society should be ruled by what? This is so un-American, guys. So, so far, you're like, Aristotle sounds like a guy who goes to NASCAR and he just like likes, he probably has a bald eagle tattoo. He's very American sounding, like a lot of American ideas here. Community, local community flourishing. Sounds awesome. This is not American. Aristotle, oh, so go oh, ahead. The elite. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. People like Nancy Pelosi, Mitch McConnell, whatever, mm -hmm. and the tech guys, and an enlightened oligarchy. Yeah, exactly. 
he believes you should ask Nancy Pelosi what to do and just obey her and obey Jeff Bezos and obey Mitch McConnell. Our, our leader should lead us. An enlightened oligarchy. Uh, well, I don't know. You know, and again, look at the, this. The, we're almost done, actually. This is awesome. It's been such a chock full, like a very like intense class. A lot of great themes. But if you compare, anyone wants to go back and watch this later, um, this is part two of one lecture. I mean, we'll have done three hours on Aristotle. Really quickly, in terms of in terms of influence, guys. Remember, I said Saint Thomas Aquinas is influenced by Aristotle, but but Augustine by Plato. So Plato says uh, Plato and Augustine. Let's say we say Augustine influenced by Plato. Augustine says, "What about the state? Is the state good, bad? What does Augustine say? He was influenced by Plato. He says the state is a necessary evil. Augustine says, kind of, the state is not good. The state is a necessary evil. Augustine influenced by Plato." It is only for like pe keeping people from being like criminals, whatever. You got to just have leaders. It's not good though. Whereas Aquinas said the state is naturally good. Politics are desirable in and of themselves. If we were not fallen, Aquinas, falling Aristotle, we still want to be in a polis because that helps us have beautiful acts. You guys know how much I, I'm a huge football fan I am. I love that our society is stable enough. I can't wait to watch the Super Bowl, even though I hate both those teams they're playing. Like, can the Chiefs and Eagles both lose? That would be, be preferable. Although, in case anyone knows, uh, the kicker of the Kansas City Chiefs, Harrison Butker, is an altar boy. He's a grown man. He serves Latin mass. I'm dead serious. Wow. You can go go look up, type in EWTN, just Chiefs kicker. His name's Harrison Butker, but maybe you won't remember his name. But um, you can type in just Kansas City Chiefs kicker Latin mass, and there's EWTN feature on it. Huh. He after like, what a freaking baller. So I'm rooting for the Chiefs because of Harrison Butker. Latin mass. Exactly. Absolute stuff. Right absolute stuff. And they ask him why. He does it all the way. He's like so reverent. He loves kneeling to receive the Eucharist. He's a legit Catholic. Like he's not like, oh, you know, Catholic Catholic. He's like legit, legit, legit. Um, so I'm rooting for the Chiefs because of Harrison Butker. He's the man. He's also my best friend. He's my card. We play cards together often. Um, but like, I'm, I'm glad our society is stable enough. We talk, I love football. Coach Eck is so, anyone know Coach Eck personally? Heard really great things about him. The Vandal coach. He's a really great guy. Some of the football players here say like he's like a wonderful, in addition to being a good coach, they almost had a great season last, as you know, last fall, first time in the playoffs in 20 years. Apparently, Eck is a really good guy. I'm really glad our society is stable and healthy enough that we can do things like football, artistic things like football that are not, they're not necessary. If we had a nuclear war, no one's like, when's the football game? Like, let's get to the shelter and find food. I'm glad we don't live in this Darwinist existence. So I'm with Aquinas and Aristotle. The state is good because that enables people like Coach Eck to coach the Vandals and Harrison Bucker to kick field goals, after which he goes to do the most important beautiful stuff of serving the, the Latin mm -hmm. Um Since we see that every state, since we see that every city state, in Moscow, this is our city state here, it's our polis. Since we see that every city state is sort of community, that every community is established for the sake of some good, or everyone does everything for the sake of what they believe to be good, but you know, is it right order or not? It is clear every community aims at some good. And the community which has the most authority of all and includes all the other aims highest, that is, at the good with the most authority. That is what, this is what is called the city state or political community. So I, first of all, totally effed up reading that and bumbled it through, I'm so sorry. Um, so I made it even, it's already complex enough. I made it, you know, mea culpa, I made it more complex. What he's saying here is all men and women aim at some good. Well, if we have a right ordered city state, we can all aim at some good together. And we can all go support the vandals together. And we have division of labor, you know, like Brad can be starting quarterback. He's great at that. But we'll just support him from the stands. And Dave will coach the team. But if Dave coaches the team, he's probably, you know, fired after two games. I don't know. And it's like performance of the field and scandals off the field, at both at the same time. Yeah. I've said I've said many times, I've told you many times, if I ever run for office, it says this is a running joke. I'm sorry, I'm gonna repeat again. If I ever run for office, I will I will instruct my team to put out a bunch of like salacious scandals about me that are fake. Because then people are like, well, you know, she dropped out of the race and it keeps turning out that they're all fake. I he's clean as a whistle. And so instead of just being clean the whole time. Now I'm like double clean. People thought I was corrupt, but I'm not not corrupt. <laughs> but I put out all these big for all the supposed scandals. Exactly. So and then you can go exactly. I become famous slash infamous. Like it, the, everyone knows the George Santos story, yes? 
God bless George Santos. God have mercy on all people. George Santos, you don't know, is the guy who's elected in New York, who apparently his entire resume is fake. I don't want to judge. Judge lest, you judge not lest you be judged, right? That's not good, right? If he was elected by just completely making up, like I worked at this bank or whatever, none of it is true. That's obviously one of the Ten Commandments is do not bear false witness. We're not supposed, lying is bad. That's the dad telling him on that. Everyone knows lying is bad. But imagine, like if it turns out George Santos actually, he, it was all legit. He was doing my theory. Like he put out these fake scandals and it turns out he actually did all these things. He'd be like, George Santos is a legend. Like we, he was elected and there's this huge scandal and he became infamous in America for being the most Paul, most Paul political politician, the most corrupt guy. He just lied in his fake, but it's actually all true. So now he has the infamy slash fame and everyone's like, oh, I'm sorry that I doubted him. And it'd be amazing. So I'm still hoping for that for his sake because it really hurt. Yeah. You better hurry up. You better start releasing the yeah. yeah. Now, yeah. now it's George. Now, now go go. Exactly. Um, okay. Uh, Aristotle understands the fundamental normative problem of politics. Ooh, that's a high claim. What constitutional form should the lawgiver establish and preserve? In what material for the sake of what end? Okay. The fundamental problem of politics, what constitutional form should the lawgiver establish and preserve in what material for the sake of what? The fundamental form of a problem of politics is what? Is what system? Is how? He believes in this in mixed government, but you can have direct democracy. We don't have direct democracy. You have representative government, obviously. You can have oligarchy. Pat, would I want you to be leader of America? Yeah, absolutely sure. But maybe you have a bad leader. I don't know. Like there's the, the, the number one form because we all get together is what kind of government? Like I said, all of us are Democrats, small, you might actually be in the Democratic Party or the Republican Party or you're neither, you know, Tea Party, whatever, but all of us believe in democracy, small d. And Aristotle says, that's the fundamental question. What should the government be made up of? Uh, okay, I think I'm done. I think we've talked enough about Aristotle. Really, we've had three hours in Aristotle. Just remember, in, in let's, let's recap him. Aristotle, the student of Plato, departs from Plato. Plato is united with Socrates in a very abstract form. And they they both, Plato especially influenced people like St. Augustine and the Neoplatonists of the early 80 decades, centuries, excuse me. Aquinas, for whom we will spend six classes. Anyone joining the class now in person and online, you come at a great time because after we do two classes on Cicero, starting on Wednesday, we're just gonna do six classes on Aquinas. I'm super pumped. He's influenced by Aristotle. Aristotle was very much about, right, that the ultimate, he's very much about telos, first of all, that everything has an end and it begin with the end in sight. And the end is eudaimonia. And you reach eudaimonia by excellence of virtue arete, driven by accordance with logos. Logos is, helps you reach golden meanability in all parts of your personal life, a right ordered soul of temperance. Remember the, the artwork's the best example. The perfect story is golden mean, not when it's mediocre, but when you can't add or subtract from it. And in fact, the book of Revelation, St. John's Apocalypse, the last, lines are anyone who adds or subtracts from this book is like anathema, right? It's like, you can't do that. It's perfect. It's the perfect word of God. Leave it alone. It's exactly how it should be. Um, and the, the political state, therefore, in all these things has, the political state is the person writ large. If the individual person, Clay, Sam, myself, we're all trying to have a rete, eudaimonia, aiming at certain goals, all of us should get together. Why? Not because it's a necessary evil, imperfect contrition, but the perfect love of it'll enable us to do noble acts. So all that makes sense. Anyone have any questions on that? That's pretty airtight, if I do say so myself. I know you can't make it for the HIPAA lecture. Um, we have this discussion too, because um, and I have the same problem too. I'm, I'm thankful when I do my HIPAA lecture, my wife puts the kids to bed, puts the kids to bed that time. But on the 15th, I'm gonna, I guess I'm gonna see Mariah Carey, guys, all right? That's gonna be fun. I think it's gonna be fun. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe people don't think so, but. Like, I, I feel like I have time left. I'm just, I'm just uh, yeah, if you're like, wait a second, what does that have to do with Aristotle? Nothing. Aristotle's done. Now we're talking about Mariah Carey. Anyone have any questions? Anyone want to have any final thoughts they want to add? We're like done. I don't want really to say super early. I'm like, I, this is actually my preferred ideal thing. If we can, I say this to all my classes, and I always say this, you know, to, to you guys, to you, Vi, WSU, wherever I am. Um, and you asked once too, because this is funny. Like you said that you said, you wonder how I am in like over there. And like, really the same. Like, the, 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 the awesome thing about being here is like, well, well, so like, I I am overt I am overtly Catholic in my role here, you know. Thank God, you know. And I'll I'll, I'll be like like so that is not. I don't leave my faith at the door, and I so much cling to, 
Matthew 10, 32, 33, you know, he acknowledges me for others. I will acknowledge not. If anyone ever asked me, like, are you a Christian? I, I mean, I'm a covenant. Yeah. And I'm not going to like maybe go into it and, you know, preach and, but like, but so that's the one noticeable difference in this class. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm maximally, you know, Catholic and yes, way more. Like I don't, I, I've never sang in class like at WSU, mm -hmm. but I mean, no, it's like, that's like a very similar style. And on that note, apropos of that, I say the same thing there. I say here, like, I'm, let's get it done and get out of here. Like, it's so fun to be together, but like, we're done. So there's no point. Oh, the class technically goes to 955. We're done. I am done there for anyone have any other questions I'd like to ask anything before we sign up. Yeah, I have a question. Go ahead. So if we were all aiming at the same good, this person on virtues and uh like this common this common goal, uh what is like compulsory education, formation, indoctrination, wouldn't that like be helpful for maintaining everybody's sole focus because it seems like everybody's listening to the different voices. We all have different teachers, we're all seeking after different goods. Yeah. And that resulting in, you know, the degradation of society. Yeah. So, so we're listening to one person. Yes. Like so, Joel Osteen. What if we just all listen to Joel? Exactly. Everyone has to go to either Joel Osteen's mega church in person or watch his sermons online. And then we're going to agree he has, he's cracked the code of the common good. Exactly. Yes. You raise an excellent point. It, you have to avoid something. You're not doing this. You, not you, Clay, a person. You have to avoid a historicity. You have to actually look at well, what time we live in now. No one ever lives in a vacuum. There's real conditions. We do not live in Aristotelian society. Right. Exactly. We live in a very permissive, often maybe you think horrifying. I mean, people that I know that like homeschool their kids or against like public school believe, yeah, it's awful. Like, I don't like the values of society. So number one, no, in America, we are the complete, we don't have any common values. That's actually scary. There's not, do, is America, does America even have basic Christian values of like love God, love neighbor anymore? I don't even know if we have that. I love when I meet, you know, Protestants, um, Orthodox, even like other Christians that aren't Catholic. And like, oh, you're my, my brother and my sister. Thank God. You know, believe in God, believe in Christ. And, and believe in like the Ten Commandments is basically that's not true about society anymore. Even so we don't have any common goals. Yes, maybe what you're asking is, well, we need to have establish kind of a tyranny, sort of a top down. Yeah, and he they're for that. They literally said enlightened oligarchy. They didn't say don't hurt everyone's feelings. Oh, how dare you? You know, they said like let's have a a tyranny, a tyrannical system. Um, enforce these kind of we have to decide what it is. So maybe it's Joel Osteen for us, or it's you know whatever. Yeah, yeah. In a sense, that wouldn't. That would be the opposite of tyranny, though. If it was because it was it, freely ascended, right? Yeah. Got tyranny it. is like seeking control for your own. Yeah. Life. Well, so then, then he's saying, I guess it would be most desirable because it's just very human, ultimate, basic psychology for everyone to want it. But you would need some kind of top down. They're, they're for centralization. They're for the, the labor is divided in the city where we pursue the common good in our diverse ways. But the overall beating heart of what we're about is this one, whatever it is. And, yeah. Right. There you go. Father, um, would you close us out in prayer? You, uh, Father, as, as I say, anyone who's listening, like uh, having a priest in class, super blessing and treat. Thank you. And so I always profit, if you don't mind, I'm either starting or ending the class of prayer. So if you, if you would, please. Thank you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, our Father, you are the giver of wisdom. We ask you to bless us, inspire us. That we may grow in your own wisdom through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. The light of God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.